And he is on the phone with us. Haven't seen him for a while. Dr. Shannon, good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? Wonderful. Good to have you on the air with us here today. And boy, nothing more timely. You're not busy there at Urgicare at all, are you? Uh, no, not at all. I'm <laughs> back. <laughs> no, we've been, uh, you know, it, it, we've been extremely, um, extremely busy. Not necessarily. It seems like the social distancing in the community has lessened our traffic at the Urgy Cares, but uh, I've been very busy uh, up at the hospital with preparations. Mm -hmm. uh, the hospital uh, staff, medical staff, and nursing team, uh, probably for about the past three to four weeks, uh, we've had some very robust um, meetings and preparation, um, and, and I think um, we're actually above the curve as far as uh, hospital preparedness for this possible outbreak in this area than probably any other hospital could be. That's amazing to me that uh, this is one thing that everybody saw was coming, and uh, it's it's really interesting to watch how some are still prepared for it and some are just completely unprepared. And it's good to know that IRMC has been working on it for a while. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what people experience when they are <laughs> affected by COVID-19, because we're hearing all kinds of things about if you're symptomatic, if you're not symptomatic, and people might not even know what the symptoms are. Yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a good question, and it seems by looking at the medical literature that primarily the number one symptom that, that patients will experience is fever. Uh, probably greater than 90% of the patients that have COVID-19 will experience fever. Um, and then the second symptom would be cough, primarily dry but there are also some people that may actually develop a wet cough uh, from COVID-19. And then down the list would be like your body aches and, you know, your muscular pains and your joint pains. Um, you know, unfortunately, what complicates COVID-19 is the timing. The timing is horrible because right now we're experiencing a large amount of patients that, have, or that are experiencing influenza A. Mm -hmm. And the number one, number one, and number two signs of influenza A is cough and fever, followed by body aches. So uh, that kind of confounds the issue. Um, I mean, if this COVID nineteen, um, if this COVID nineteen outbreak occurred in July, uh, it'd be easier to pick these people out of the uh, you know proverbial needle in a haystack right now. Yeah. So that does complicate matters, but I think the public should you know, somewhat rest assured that, you know, greater than 95 to 98 percent of the patients are going to experience mild symptoms and, um, and and we'll make it through this with make it through this unscathed. Yeah, absolutely. So what should somebody do who has those symptoms? Uh, uh, the first step is not to rush down to Urgicare, is it? That is correct. Um, if you are experiencing fevers, coughs, body aches, and you're doing okay, and you're not experiencing any significant shortness of breath or, you know, uh, weakness, um, you should stay at home. Um, open up your can of chicken noodle soup, <laughs> take your Tylenol and your Motrin as directed, and monitor yourself closely. But by all means, if you're experiencing, you know, significant chest discomfort, uh, significant shortness of breath, uh, I mean, that's why RMC's here. You know, you come off the campus, uh, when you enter campus, uh, now you will be asked a series of questions, and you may be sent to a certain area that we have set up to further evaluate these symptoms. Um, but by all means, if there's a patient that is having significant symptoms, including you know significant shortness of breath, then by all means come up to campus. Yeah. But if you're experiencing mild symptoms, stay at home and practice social distancing. You know, don't swing by Graham's house to pick the chicken noodle soup up. Use what you have at your house. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. And, and there are certainly uh, people who are more at risk than others in terms of the effect that COVID-19 would have on them, correct? That is correct. It seems to be the elderly population and those patients that have uh, also have um, comorbidities, and I mean other problems such as heart disease, diabetes, significant uh, pre-existing lung conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and emphysema. One of the things that has impressed me lately has been watching how across the world people are following COVID-19 
and learning about it on a daily basis. I would assume you being in the medical profession, you're getting these updates and, and you have much more information uh, even than, than we would as a general public. Uh, so some of those developments come in and you know about them probably earlier than anybody else. Um, you know, and that's, you know, we may know a little bit quicker than other people just simply really because we've got colleagues scattered across the United States. Um, and, you know, when something like this happens, I may reach out to one of my fellow ER docs that I trained with that's in Nevada and say, hey, you know, what's, what's going on out there? What are you seeing? So all of our physicians on staff are actively engaged in kind of that um, higher frequency conversation with staff members across um, the United States. You know, one of the first things we did was uh, we had a contact in Seattle that happened to be the chief medical officer of a major hospital that's taken a hit out there. Yeah. And uh, it was a guy from Johnstown that, we, that um, uh, one of our other physicians used to work with that I used to work with. We reached out to him to get some kind of boots-on-the-ground information that would help us craft our plan for this hospital. So we, what we did as a hospital is we actually went right to a hospital that's ground zero, and we're kind of modeling our response plan off of some of the things they did well and some of the things that they wish they did. And the implementations that we're putting in this hospital in the next few days all was on their wish list. It may be somewhat of an inconvenience for patients arriving to campus. However, it's things that I think that some hospitals in Seattle wish they would have implemented uh, at the stage that we are at right now. Yeah, you got to go to school on them, and it sounds like you are. Uh, we had uh, one of our staff members had to visit Urgicare the other day, completely unrelated to illness, had, had fallen and suffered an injury. Uh, and she was saying how impressed she was with the procedures that were followed when she got there and how quickly uh, the hospital staff reacted to her presence and uh, uh, to anybody else who was coming in for any other reason. Um, those procedures, uh, I know that you practice those and uh, you review them constantly, but uh, she was really impressed with the way they got her through um, the ER where you have to enter if you're going to urge care and then took her to a special area that would be away from people who were sick to an area where someone like her who was injured uh, would not be exposed to uh, to anybody else. Yeah, so um, about early last week, we decided to do our best to try to separate sick from not sick, in meaning, you know, if you're coming to the urgent cares and you have exactly that, you're feeling fine, but you just twisted your ankle, you know, we don't want those people sitting beside somebody that's actually got a cough or a sore throat. So we're making the best with what we have. Um, and, you know, we have went ahead and, and made some uh, some accommodation changes just to try to practice really some social distancing in our own setting. Yeah, yeah. And I know you mentioned the type A flu a couple of uh, moments ago, and uh, the flu report came in, and they're still on the rise. And type A really had a big increase in Indiana County. I think there were 64 New cases of flu last week diagnosed in Indiana County. Fifty-three of them were type A, so it's really starting to march a little bit. I think one of the things that uh, we always have to understand is that whether it's COVID or flu or anything else that is infectious, you have to protect your staff because you're not only protecting the public, uh, but your staff members, they don't want to get it and they don't want to pass it on to anybody else. So the extraordinary measures in place there, too. Right. And, you know, we started that back in November, um, IRMC, we've, you know, instilled in our employees and developed a fairly robust vaccination program for influenza uh, that we begin every November. So um, I'm probably greater than 98% of our staff has actually been immunized for influenza. The people that could not get the vaccine were most likely employees that were allergic uh, to it. So that was step one is vaccination. Step two was educating the staff. You know, we're constantly in contact with our staff and discussing cases that we see on a day-by-day basis as to, you know, really what's in town. Um, You know, is it flu? Is it uh, maybe whooping cough? We went through that spell several months ago. So we try to educate our staff. Um, We're always um, reviewing uh, different safety standards uh, in regards to how do you wash your hands? Should you mask? Should you not mask? Uh, things of that nature. Important stuff. Dr. Pat Shannon, we're so grateful that you're able to call in and speak with us today. We appreciate it. Yeah, and, you know, the other thing, and I just want to impress this 
upon the, the, the community as a whole. Mm-hmm. Uh, IRMC, uh, once again, we are taking every possible measure. We're following the CDC guidelines as best as we can and working with the DOH hand-in-hand. And uh, we're taking the safety of our staff, uh, our nursing staff, our physicians is paramount. We're taking that extremely serious, as well as our patients, because at the end of the day, I mean, listen, we have COVID-19 moving into this area. But at the end of the day, at all costs, we have to keep the hospital operational for the woman that's having the baby. Uh, the man that's having the heart attack or somebody that's just experienced an acute trauma. And at the end of the day, we're going to get the job done. Hey, absolutely. Dr. Shannon, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Dr. Pat Shannon, the Indiana Regional Medical Center with us here this morning. Medical Center with us here this morning.